I thought you might be interested to know a little something about the history of music in the Carey family. My grandfather, whose name was John A. Carey, enlisted at age 16 in the New York militia for the Civil War. He was wounded twice, but survived, thank goodness. He survived. And after the war, he, like thousands of other veterans, were encouraged to go west for cheap land and opportunity. So he migrated west, first to Minnesota, then South Dakota. My grandmother homesteaded a farm in South Dakota, where my father was born and raised. Uh, in, in this situation, very primitive, very primitive, it's a wonder they survived in that terrible climate. Uh, his, he had a half-brother whose name was Fred. Fred later migrated to uh, Los Angeles, Glendale, because oh, wow, he was idea. a very, very accomplished diesel mechanic. He was a half-brother to my father. Well, Fred bought a trumpet at an early age. He had some minor interest in music. He had this trumpet, and my dad, was being, was ter who is, had, was born with an inherent talent for music, wanted to play it. Well, Fred was very jealous of, of the fact that he was more talented, so he hid, he hid the mouthpiece. <laughs> My father, it is said, actually made a substitute mouthpiece out of a spool of, wooden spool of thread. <laughs> So this is how Dad Carey got started. He ended up being a brilliant trumpet player. He also ended up being able to play all instruments. When he, in our town orchestra in Watertown, South Dakota, when he no longer could play trumpet because of false teeth, he played violin in the orchestra. But that's getting ahead. Uh, Dad did not want to be a farmer. Neither one of them did, and so he they moved it in, got into city city thing, and he was developing his musical skill, playing in small jazz groups, you know, how old for is dances. He around, around this time, how old was he? Well, those days he was in his twenties. Okay. <clears throat> and what is really interesting. I don't, I don't want to belabor this, so I sort of skip around. Uh, what's really interesting is that when I was a child, we had silent movies. The way this operated, the movies would come to town by mail, and along with it would come the music. Well, my dad played in the pit band. And I can remember, like yesterday, when I was a very young, like three, four years old, Mom took me to see this famous silent movie called Old Iron Science. And Dad was playing in the pit. And I made the mistake of shouting out, Hey, Dad! <laughs> well, Mom was embarrassed. But this shows you, at this point in time, what my dad's interest, he was developing his skill on a trumpet. He was a really good, ended up being a really good trumpet player. And uh, the, the way he earned a living, they played for dances. Well, in those days, John, it was the ambition of every small town, regardless of how small, to have some kind of a band. Well, this, this is what Watertown, South Dakota, was, was heavy with this. They did it, they did it wonderfully, and they, in those days there were called Elks Club Bands. Well, this one year, which is approximately 1915, uh, the Watertown Elks Club Band, of which my father was a part, went to the the National Convention in L.A. 
they they had a contest. They had a con they had a contest to choose like a the best band from across the United States. The Watertown Elf Club band won the first prize at that annual convention. Shows you the interest and the town band was called Pex Band. Uh, he and my dad was first chair trumpet, and of course as I came along on the trombone, I joined it as a third chair, third chair trombonist, and, and not very good at it. And I, but I had the, the first chair trombone player. His name was Walter Farrell. He was an extremely accomplished musician. He not only was a wonderful trombone player, he was also an excellent violinist. He was, they played, you know, Christmas music when they had orchestras, uh, which is beside the point, but it just shows you we had concerts, we had band concerts every Friday on the courthouse lawn, and in the summertime we have this beautiful lake uh, called Lake Campesca, an Indian name, and they built a band stand at this one place on the lake, which is called City Park. So we played concerts, not every Sunday, but many Sundays on the lake, rather than the one on Friday night on the courthouse lawn. So it was just a, my dad continued and continued, which, and what is unbelievable, John, he ended up being a high school orchestra leader with an eighth grade education. Wow. Eighth grade, and he's listed on the, on the internet for composing not, not highly refined, just uh, marches, band marches. Sure. Which, you know, but he ended up during the Depression, he's a music teacher, people could not afford you know, lessons, so he, he was doing it for a dollar a lesson. And if, if the instrument had a mechanical problem, they couldn't afford to send it to a repair. My dad had a little repair shop in the basement with a little bow torch, believe it or not. Oh, wow. To save these kids their music, he did their repairs himself. And he had this little tiny blow torch. He was very mechanically a client also. Wow. Well, and then I, of course, I was involved then. He was not involved with our local high school then. During the Depression, all of these little towns, I mean really small towns, wanted music for their kids. They could not afford a full-time music leader. My dad went out and sold his services. He had about five different schools. He went there for one day, charged them so much money for the whole day, and they had a band. At the end of the day, he'd have a short band concert in that little, little town. And uh, I had the pleasure of traveling with him because this one town, they had a, they, more than one, they had kids my age, I could spend the day swimming in their local lake or whatever it was. And uh, at night I would play with my, I, of course I'd play with the band when they had their concert. So I, I enjoyed being with him, he enjoyed me having him with him. And we'd get home at night, sometimes 9, 10, 11 o'clock. That was during the depression, he kept music going. He had, and he organ, he had a music studio. And my, my, my great privilege, I was the janitor. It had a, had a long stairway to the second floor, which was open to the air and dirty. And I had to keep that stairway clean. I, I painted his studios. He had a, he had a violin teacher, a good one. He had a wonderful piano teacher all in this one spot, mm -hmm. and they taught music there during the Great Depression, which was obviously difficult 
when nobody had money for this sort of thing. Well, uh, in, I, in the high school, we didn't even have a full band. We had a pet band, and that's what I did. I, I was, uh, I, I played in the pet band, trombone, and uh, enjoyed every minute of it. And uh, we, it, they, everything is Indian. Their, uh, their homecoming is a Kai Yai Day, you know, it's all Indian. Oh, sure. And the, the homecoming, <laughs> This is a joke. I shouldn't tell you this. The homecoming people is the, is the chief and princess. Believe it or not, the girl that I went through all through school with was the princess and I was the chief. I had to wear this uniform. I actually have the uniform, the horns, the horns, the uniform. This is corny as you can get. And it's in the, it shows in the, in the one uh, annual paper, they had pictures of us. <laughs> well then, then I, I, I had to decide what I wanted to do for an education because my parents were absolutely not involved at all, which is kind of strange, uh, since my dad was so heavily involved with education. Uh, and I decided to attend a trade school in uh, Minnesota, Mankato, Minnesota, accounting and that sort of thing. And one day a man came in, he was a pr previous graduate. He wanted to hire somebody at a General Mills Farm Service store in Butler, Pennsylvania. Believe it or not, that's what I was looking for. I took the job and traveled 1,100 miles not knowing a soul and worked in Butler, Pennsylvania. That's completely western Pennsylvania, northwestern. Well, I didn't like it, and I, tr I traveled to, uh, I resigned. I didn't like the work. I, I don't like to prove that two and two is four. And, uh, uh, Unlike somebody else in the room. Math isn't for everyone. I traveled to, to uh, Cleveland, where we had good friends, and by coincidence, he talked me into talking to his boss who wanted to hire an underwriter. And that ex I was hired in 10 minutes as an insurance underwriter. And that ex I'm only telling you this to explain how the Carey family, which started in South Dakota, ended up in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, that's great. And, uh, and I'm not embellishing it. I don't want to make it sound complicated. And I thought nothing of going living... That was my ambition, work for a big company. Well, this is a farm service store where we sort of hog feed, horse feed, and I had terrible problems with my allergies. There was lots of reasons why I left it. And I, I, and I had a wonderful boss. There was not any bad feelings. Well then, in Cleveland, uh, I had a, one of my army buddies. Uh, well, no, I'm, now I gotta get ahead. In 1942, I knew that I would eventually be drafted. And I had a dumb, dumb dislike for being pushed around. I don't like that. So what did I do? I enlisted. Smart. I enlisted. And I knew where I, even what, this was a very peculiar, the auto dealers in Ohio, agreed to enlist one maintenance battalion for one armored division. I knew where I would be, but when they found out down in Georgia where I ended up, Fort Benning, they found out I was a musician. They transferred me to the Air Force from the Armored Force, which wow. was, which is, I can't tell you what a blessing that was. Yeah, no kidding. And we, they were forming a new Air Force band at Fort Benning. That's where the paratroopers learned to jump. This was the troop called the Troop Carrier Command. And so here I am now, I'm in the military. In World War I, you might wonder why I'm backtracking. World War I, my dear father, they had a army band of the 1st South Dakota Cavalry. They were stationed on the Mexican border 
guarding, actually in World War I, they were at, my dad was an army musician on the Mexican border. I got all kinds of photographs of it. And uh, World War II, by the grace of God, I ended up being an Air Force musician. And I heard all my young lives, you know, young days. In fact, I had my, my father's army hat from World War I. And here I am, so blessed. And, and the blessing, not only from the basic fact, we had professional musicians who were drafted. Oh, wow. Our lead, our lead then, th th from that, th then I was transferred to a same thing in Fort Wayne, Indiana called Bearfield. Our lead trumpet was the lead trumpet at the Roxy Theater in New York. Fantastic. And here I am learning. I, I was not, you know, at his point in, in accomplishment at that time. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I was learning it very quickly. Oh, yeah. Our, our piano man, we had two piano players, professionals. One of them was the piano man at Radio City Music Hall. Can you believe that? Jeez. He was a society type dance piano. The other one was a number one Dixieland, his name was Don Ewell. He was the number one Dixieland pianist in the world. After the war, he traveled with Jack Teagarden. You might not know that, that's a famous name in the trombone world. He's one of the pioneer jazz, famous jazz trombonists, mm -hmm. wonderful musician. They traveled the Far East for the State Department, just like Louis Armstrong did for the State Department. This was such a rare opportunity, and we had a terrific jazz band. You know, the, in the Army, the T.O. in the Army is 28 men for a band. But then in that nucleus, you have a jazz band, plays for all the, the social functions, sure. entertain the troops. So what I was trying to tell you, John, is that I, I was blessed yeah. all my life to that point. One coincidence led to another coincidence. Now we're living in Cleveland. Now I'm going to go. Uh, I started singing as a church singer 80 years ago and in Cleveland I was at church St. Paul's Church in Berea, Ohio where Baldwin Wallace College is. I was a choir singer and soloist. Well one day we're reading the paper famous guy named Robert Shaw came to Cleveland to be director of the chorus and assistant director of the famous Cleveland Symphony Orchestra. And he put a notice in the paper he was going to do auditions for the chorus. Well, I, Mary said, and said, why don't you do it? I said, I don't think, I really didn't think I was good enough. Well, to make a long story short, she said, you've got nothing to lose. And she was absolutely correct. I, I went to Severance Hall, which is a, one of the most beautiful concert halls in the United States. There were three people in the room. Robert Shaw was sitting in the audience. The piano player, accompanist, and I were on stage. And you know, I truthfully wasn't quite at that elevation as a singer at that time, mm -hmm. but I and you can't believe what he did. I had to sight read, read Latin masses. <laughs> and thanks God I studied Latin in high school. I had frankly never sung Latin before. And I studied it, so I, the, the words, the, the lyrics didn't bother me. But here I am sight reading <laughs> something that I had never, had never been at that level. In front of Robert Shaw. And I'll tell you frankly, my, my uh, feeling, number one, he knew that I was a musician, which is, a, you gotta have that background. 
Number two, he liked my voice. Mm -hmm. And I passed the audition, I sang for three years with a wonderful 200 voice, all the wow. famous masses, Beethoven's Ninth, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. I, I just, it was the epitome of my well, musical you, career. You got all that in the, those albums, you know. Mm -hmm. you still I don't know whether you still have that all. Yeah, I believe we have it back in my parents' house. Well, that'll, that'll, yeah, show, that'll, great show, stuff. that'll show my name. Yeah. Ken Carey. Well, then, so many of, particularly of the school music people, wanted to get in to get an education under Robert Shaw. Of course, yeah. He couldn't do it unless he got some out. So he re auditioned the entire chorus, and for this, for this, he permitted us to bring our own music, which means it was a piece of cake. Yeah, you could prepare. And he complimented me and asked me to sing a little more. So here I am, uh, a, a country boy from South Dakota, singing with one of the world's leading orchestras. And my dad could play every instrument. The only thing my dad could not do was sing. My brother went to Carleton College. My brother started singing at an early age. Amateur contest, like he's 10 years old, he won. One, and uh, he ended up at Carleton College in Minnesota, which is a famous school, and he studied voice. And, oh, wow. af and after the, and he became a naval officer, he, was, he went through the stuff in the Pacific, in the Navy, he was a naval officer. After the war, he did extensive singing, like the Christmas stuff, in towns around that didn't have a soloist. And he, and he, so he was much more active at that point than I was in, in voice. And he, he and his, he and his dear wife did something that you can't believe. They took Broadway musicals, cut them down into excerpts. He had a good piano player. His wife did the scripting, did the talking. He, he recorded this Broadway stuff. Wow. And when he, when he was in the furniture business, when they went to Chicago, there was a famous bar there. They invited him to sing. He sang in Chicago with this famous, famous bar. Well, Bob stayed in the home, hometown of South Dakota. He did not leave and had a wonderful business in furniture and decorating. And among all of his accomplishments, he and some other people were the first to design and start the South Dakota Fine Arts Society. It's a state, it's a state thing, and they have a museum. They got a beautiful museum started, and you, you can't believe what the peace de resistance is. There's a woman in my hometown she became an international dealer for uh, the type of expensive linens done on an island near Portugal. Their principal exhibit is this stuff is, to, is exhibited in this museum. She has long ago passed away. And they've got this, if you were ever in South Dakota, you could uh, you could see this wonderful, well, of course, they've got paintings, Remington and all that, but the thing that's outstanding, their number one thing is this terrific linen collection, all handwork. It's rare. It's very rare stuff. Well, at the same time, it, the State University is in Vermilion, South Dakota, down the southeast corner. That's where the university is, South Dakota University. The man that was in charge of music at that university had an intense desire to collect antique instruments. He started probably a hundred years ago. Well, because of his work, there is in this little town a museum devoted to antique instruments. Mm. And Mary and I fortunately went there to see it. 
And then his son took, my brother was on the board of directors for many years of this museum. And it got me interested. I never had any interest in antique instruments, but it got me aware of the subject. And when we were in Germany, uh, I realized there is, Munich has a museum called the Museum, Museum Stadt, Museum, S-T-A-D-T. Stadt is the German word for local, for city, for mm -hmm. city municipality. And they have, they have the second best music, antique musical instrument exhibit in the world. The number one is New York City, mm -hmm. the New York Museum of Fine Arts. They got a floor, one floor dedicated to, and I went to this, and uh, unfortunately I almost forgot about it. It was late in the day, and I hired a taxi, and I made the guy promise, you come back in an hour and a half. If you don't, I'm lost. I don't know where I am. And by golly, he did it. He did what he promised. Well, in the meantime, I go in this museum, there was nobody in there except the director. He gave me a guided tour. Wow. And it was so interesting. The, the one part that I would never have expected to see were jungle rhythm instruments from Africa. Long, five, eight, ten feet hollowed out logs that they beat on wow. for their rhythm. And people don't realize, non-musicians, every commercial that we see on television has a rhythm background. People don't know that. They don't, of course, being a musician, I know that. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening, what kind, of, what kind of a beat are they going to have for this performance? All depending on the performance. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a guided tour, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. That I have, I lucked out. Mm -hmm. Of course, it gave you a feeling, it gave you a feeling, how did those poor musicians get music out of these old, antique, the trombones? Mm -hmm. I don't know how the hell they ever got music out of those, they were so beat up, you know? Yeah. Primitive instruments? Yeah. Well, this is just a part of my, of my life. I'm trying to... Uh, I uh, tell you, John, that uh, now, now we come back to my voice thing. Mm -hmm. We're now, we're now, we had, I, unfortunately, I lost my connection to the Cleveland Orchestra because we moved to Columbus to take my job. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, <laughs> this is a joke, the year that I left, the Cleveland Orchestra Chorus went to that famous Casal Music Festival down in the Mediterranean someplace. Oh, yeah. You know about that? They probably, maybe they still have it. I don't know. And poor Ken left a year or two early. I didn't. <laughs> I, 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 missed, I missed out on the only a, a wonderful trip to that music festival. He was a famous cellist. Famous cellist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had this music festival. Well, then we moved to Columbus, and I, for some reason or other, I did not have uh, enough ambition or lack of interest to join. The, they have a good, they have a good symphony chorus here, Columbus. Yeah. But I didn't do it, and I joined the Presbyterian. We joined the Pres, and we had the blessing of directors from Otterbein University as our choir directors. Oh wow. And they recognized, they, I started doing a lot more serious stuff with the, with the choir, solo stuff. In fact, this one, one director from Otterbein, later in life, went to Russia, Kiev. He was director of the Kiev Symphony. He went there on a religious mission, but he ended up being and they traveled to the United States. I didn't hear them. They, they, they appeared in one. And one day, I was in the summertime, I was doing a solo, 
a voice saw, and lo and behold, he and his wife were there in the audience. They had come just back to visit. His father was still in Ohio. And after I, after I was, in fact, Mary Lee babysat their child. So we were pretty close. Mm -hmm. And after the service, he came up to me, he said, Ken, I hope I can sing that well when I'm 65 years old. That's what he said. <laughs> so, 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 so much good fortune in music. Mm -hmm. It's exactly. been my life, lifeblood. Now where we live, I sing once a month. And uh, I wish my voice were better. It's not good at all now because of this condition. But I, I struck it out. We have one lady pianist. Mm -hmm. Her name is Kathy Albrecht. For among her many accomplishments, she's a graduate of Capital University. Oh, yeah. All right. She said when she was there, she would practice seven hours a day. Sounds about right. That's <laughs> <laughs> the pianists there were crazy. They had crazy discipline. So. Yeah. Well, she and I hit it off. She's got a nice person. She's an artist. She is the accompanist, she's the piano accompanist for the Columbus Ballet rehearsals, you know, mm -hmm. got to have music, obviously, I shouldn't say something so obvious. <laughs> anyway, she liked my voice, she knew that I was a musician, she and I sang, <laughs> this is dumb, we've never had a rehearsal. <laughs> And we don't know what key we're going to do it in. I'm tr and we have been very successful doing it. Mm -hmm. We made a couple of flubs when I, when we took off. It was too low a key or too high a key. But uh, we, neither one of us has any music. The only thing, my only failing as a singer, I am a complete blank for memorizing words. Why? Because I played the trombone where the words don't mean a thing. Yeah, and you got the music in front of you usually. Yeah, but trombone, you're blowing a horn. Yeah, that's you're true. Not, I'm not memorizing words. So I have that. So when she and I sing, which is once a month, I have to have the printed words. That's my only... But I have people say that I have a beautiful voice. No kidding. Yeah, well, you still carry your voice now. I mean, you're filling the room up with sound. Yeah. It's just, uh, and, and the ridiculous part of it is that all my voice work had been the tough stuff, the symphony stuff, the masses, mm -hmm. Beethoven's Night. And here I'm sitting in the, uh, since I am a trombonist, I'm sitting here in the chorus I sang with the world's best tenor. What was his name, Mary? What was the name of the tenor? The, I can't think. He was a Jewish person. He was the number one tenor in the world. Mm -hmm. And he was doing a solo performance with the Richard orchestra. Richard Tucker. What? Richard Tucker. Yeah, Richard Tucker. Oh, okay. Do you, if you look in the book, he was, yeah, he, I'll look him up. He was a Jewish, Jewish guy, number one tenor in the world. And here, here I am, he's walking 10 feet away from me, and I'm in the chorus, I'm, and I'm watching this wonderful orchestra, these fantastic musicians. What a pleasure it is yeah. to be that close, and just, you know, it's just blessing upon blessing I had with music. But then when we moved here, I had to, that course, I sang three years, and I passed both auditions with Robert Shaw. Who would ever think that I'd ever do that? And my brother never even had, he studied, he was, he was a good singer. And, but he never had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he was a little bit shocked that I went that far with voice because I did it without a lesson. Right. Now, Mom, didn't you play the piano when you were a kid? Yes, she did. Yeah, do you, so you played the piano, did your, Anybody in your family, like your mother? She, she or? played the piano. She learned everything about the piano except the most important thing, which is to enjoy it. She didn't enjoy it, so therefore she didn't play it. She didn't continue. 
Oh, so you played. Yeah. I even bought her one of those electronic organs. Oh, I remember. Yeah. I remember I'm that. Trying, trying to get her back into it. So is that the story of the organ in your house? Yeah. That big organ that you had in the house, yeah. that's the story of it, because mom used to play the piano, so you thought she she would uh, play again if you bought her the organ? <laughs> but she didn't get interested at all. It was well, a waste of money. Well, oh, yeah, but she right. had all the kids she was now, raising. Now, John, you might ask, what type of music do we sing? We sing a lot of Broadway stuff. You're talking about nowadays, right? I beg your pardon? You're, you mean nowadays? Yeah, and that's what's unusual because my previous voice experience was none of that. Yeah. I could have done it in the Army band that I, I could have sung, but it didn't. We had, incidentally, our director of our jazz band was the same job at the most famous hotel in Chicago. They had a permanent band whose name I have forgotten. He, he led our jazz band and sang, so I, they didn't need me to sing, but I could have. Now, I'm going to, this is a piece of uh, junk that I sing. <clears throat> oh, good, good. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Do you need a drink of water before you sing? Yeah, give me right there, right there, that little glass. This little glass? Because I don't know the words to anything, literally. It's all right. You can just make them up if you forget them. <laughs> okay, and I did this down there in the gym. The people wanted me to sing more. Yeah. Hey, she sweet, walking down the street. I ask you very confidentially, hey, she sweet. That's it. That's great. Nice. No, that was not great. Her voice is terrible. But I, I sang... Uh, Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I'm amazed that I can sing even that low with this stuff I got going on. Yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah, and uh, got the, sound, and the sound of music. Yeah, I sang both those tunes in college. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I know you, had a, you have a good voice. Oh, thanks. I don't now, use it much, but that's all right. Now, I, 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 I don't want to belabor you or bore you. This is all but you interesting, must, not at all. You probably have a question. The big thing that people don't realize, I've got pictures in the, you know, 1910, low 1900, they all had their town bands. If you, the East Town would have a band. Mm -hmm. And I've got the pictures of these bands and it's, that history, I think, is interesting because those little towns are not going to have symphony orgs. Nowadays, my hometown, of course, does have because they got this huge school, you know, what do you call it, combined school, tracks patient, pupils from miles away, long way. It's a huge trade school and everything. Mm -hmm. We didn't have all that when I was there because right. it was, the city is, at least double in size since I lived there. And I thoroughly enjoyed being grow growing up. I also had the pleasure of caddying in a golf course and learning golf and associating with the big shots in town. I got to carry their bags. Well, that's your, um, John's music now. Oh, I don't know. If, did you, he didn't bring any of your, his music, I don't think. I could play it on my phone. Yeah, you um, could. A little bit. Well, Mom, but John, then we come up to your... I, I can't tell you the number of people that I told I got a grandson who is a composer in Hollywood. <laughs> I, you know, that's very rare. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's one in a million. Yeah, yeah, I feel lucky like you. I've, I've had a lot of luck the same you did when you were my age. Yeah. And uh, I've told everybody about you. And I'm... Incidentally, one phase of this I forgot. Uh, do you remember the band director at Capitol? 
Might possibly before you were there. You're talking about the lady. Yeah. You know, the, the choral director or the no, band No, the director? band director. Yeah. Um, played, Nick, played trumpet in the symphony. Um, I know there was Nicholas Perini, but he played horn. Um, I'm trying to think of who played the trumpet. And the, his son, incidentally, his son is a buddy of our kids. Do you know his name? Uh, what's his name? See, I have a, I told you, I have, I can, I know all the, all the phone numbers. I'm not kidding you, but I don't, I, I can't remember names. I'm bad with anyway, too. Um, this is a phase of music that I almost forgot. Uh, many, many years ago, this is 60 years ago, he, he lived in Worthington, <laughs> professor in trumpet and everything at Capitol, wonderful, wonderful guy. In fact, he's still playing, he's in his late 70s now, he's still got a tiny group that they go around and play. Uh, he thought we ought to have a band in Worthington. And he was 100% correct. So I was one of the founders. See this? Uh huh. Worthington Civic Band. I played first chair of trombone for 25 years before I retired in the Worthington Civic Band. We had two tours of Europe, played in, wow. young, played in young London. Munich, Amsterdam, we had two tours and enjoyed it, which is no big deal. You play, we played two concerts on this famous park in Paris and uh, I, did, I did the Tommy Dorsey theme song and they recorded it. You wouldn't believe how beautiful I did it. You wouldn't believe it. I'd love to hear I, that. My, Mary, you know, we've got that, that recording. Yeah, somebody's got, somebody's got some of your music somewhere. I don't know who has it's, it, though. It's, in, it's, in, a, it's in a wooden box. Mm -hmm. The only time we ever played music on a record is when we were traveling. Yeah. Jazz, all jazz. The, the, all the famous, like I mentioned, Jack Teagarden. Sure. I mean, the guy was... Another one of the historic trombone jazz artists was the black man, and I can't think of his name, Wintergreen or some unusual name. And I heard him in Chicago uh, one time when I went there when Bob was there in training, and I was in the Air Force at Fort Wayne, and he was performing in a bar. He was a he was a pioneer of jazz trombonist. Jack Teagarden is the most prominent. He played. Among, before he, he played with uh, the famous orchestra, all of the orchestras well, in New York. He came to, uh, to Columbus once. What? Tea Garden came to Columbus. Yeah, thank God, they, with my buddy playing piano, Dixieland, mm -hmm. they, they only made one appearance, Jack Tea Garden and my buddy on the piano. He, he joined this, he joined Tea Garden, which is the best Dixieland combo in the world. That's the pleasure I had. But anyway, uh, here I am. We have regular rehearsals. We play, uh, you know, summertime concert on the green. It was just another one of my many happy, blessed experiences. Mm -hmm. Now we had terrific musicians, most, many, probably most, who were school school teachers. Now they're still going. Sure. And they've, they've appeared at the Trillium two or three times and the people literally eat it up. And they there just, you are, the founder, just, one they, of the founders. They're just, there. Yeah, they're just thrilled with this band. And of course, it's much too loud. And that's, <laughs> yeah. and they have to turn off their hearing aid. <laughs> For I'd imagine and so. And of course, I... I, I listen and watch with envy. They're doing the things, my, my, the Christmas music, for example, that I did how many times? Mm -hmm. And uh, first year of trombone, and I was very dependable. Mm -hmm. But my, on the trombone, the most unusual part of my trombone playing is the tone. I have never heard anyone with a better tone 
And that's just freakish. The embouchure and everything, you know. It's no, I didn't try to do that. And that, that T. T Dorsey solo I did, incidentally, <laughs> as a joke, I didn't catch the downbeat. I missed the first note <laughs> in that part. Oh, my. But my buddy, sitting next to me, he had never, he, he had really never heard me play anything like that. He didn't know that I could do it. Right. And I finished, he said, man, that was good. <laughs> the first time he ever heard me play anything close, well, the Christmas music had a lot of soul excerpts, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I got along, my breath control, which you have to have as a singer and a musician, Absolutely. diaphragm control, it was starting to ease off some phrases that I could not comfortably last the phrase. Incidentally, where did I learn diaphragm breathing? Probably from when you were in the Army? Yes, this famous trump trumpet player. His name was Howard Gaffney. Why would I remember his name? Howard Gaffney. Brilliant. He had, you could hit him in the and the diaphragm with a sledgehammer wouldn't hurt. <laughs> he he could nervous. hold, when I first started playing with him, obviously I was running out of breath. And he taught me how to breathe, and it wasn't more than a month or two, I could stay with him, you know, you know the phrasing. Mm -hmm. People don't know you got a phrase with the bead trumpet. Yeah. And uh, uh, it only took me a month or, or two. And uh, another joke about that, experience. I was the drill master, my voice. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I didn't oh, know that. Hip, oh, by the left flank, hoes. Oh. That was my job in doing the exercise, calisthenics they call it. <laughs> and I was never really an athlete. My kids are athletes. Mm -hmm. But I, my athletic, the only thing I was good at was ice hockey and uh, tennis. I was a good tennis player. But when did that. you learn to golf? Well, golf, well, but I, yeah, I learned that as a caddy. But I was never patty, to be frank. You know, I never reached Ken's ability. Although, Most in the group that I, our yeah. old guys group, we had an old guys group every Tuesday morning up at Delaware. They have a wonderful nine-hole course for old people, nine, <laughs> three-par called Hidden Valley, just ideal for us. And I had the reputation of being the long hitter. I had the reputation for a good <laughs> swing. But, you know, that's not saying much, because they were so bad. <laughs> so you were just okay? Yeah, they, they, were did, terrible. They, they did. They, they just refused to learn how to hit a golf ball. You don't scoop it off the ground, you, you watch the once the tournament, they take divots that big, they, which causes the ball to momentarily be stuck. And then it explodes. Mm -hmm. It goes like mad. Right. And also, it also gives it backspin so you can hold it on the green. Well, they never learned that. And I couldn't, I'd be one sharp par, par three, I would be using a pitching wedge they'd be using a five iron. I mean, really not good. But we enjoyed it, okay? Yeah. And then eventually I had to quit that because of arthritis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can't grab it. I, I, I went over to tennis court several years ago when Ruth or somebody was there. No, I think Linda was there, the kids. And I tried to hit a tennis ball and it hurt like hell. Right. I didn't know I couldn't even hit a tennis ball. Gone. So I, so the Worthington Civic Band, the only one that's paid is the director. She was a, she was a high school music director at Danville, a little town in Ohio. She was highly qualified, excellent clarinetist. She first joined our band as first chair clarinetist. She's a wonderful clarinetist. Mm -hmm. But then we went through these directors in the band, 
we needed one. We knew she was the director of high school, so she took over. The, she did it for 40 years. Wow. She just retired this year. She they heard they got it. They had, they did hire another director whom I don't know. Mm -hmm. So the band's still going strong. That's amazing. I had no idea. And there's some wonderful musicians in it. Mm -hmm. we, and, took and you, we took you kids to and it's all, it's, concerts when you were it's old, mm -hmm. it's old home week when they, when they come to play a concert for us at the Troy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we took, I know John was, John, I think Kevin was still, what year did you stop playing with the Worthington Civic Band? Long time ago. Well, because I know John went. We took John up yeah. there. Really? Yeah. And then he was born in 89 and Kevin was born in 1992. And I think you... Well, you, I think, I think what you did, we did concerts at Ohio Wesleyan. That was one of our, our concert schedule. Wonderful, wonderful music hall. Mm -hmm. They got the most beautiful pipe organ in the world. Yeah, I'm an Ohio Wesleyan grad, so I know that. Yeah, so you know all about it. Either you or Doug or Ken, you, some, somebody brought the kids up there, sat in the balcony. Was that you? Uh, I think we did, and then I think we, I know we went to one of the ones up on the green with the kids. When you're yeah. There. Well, John, I'm delighted to talk to you. Well, why don't you ask Mom some questions? Yeah, that, thanks for all that. That was, that was amazing. That was a lot of good stuff.